Steps to Personal Revival, Chapter 3. Our Problems. Are they solvable? How? How can we grow to be happy and strong Christians? How can the Holy Spirit fill our lives? Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. John 15, 4. From the book Desire of Ages, page 676, we read, Abiding in Christ means a constant receiving of His Spirit, a life of unreserved surrender to His service. This two-part solution for our central problem is at the same time the way to a happy Christian life. Why? Jesus commented on these words, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. John 15, 11. Through these two steps, continually receiving the Holy Spirit and complete surrender, Christ lives in us, and it is the way to perfect happiness. Colossians 1.17 speaks about the riches of the glory. Christ in you. Isn't it remarkable that Jesus embedded in this parable of the vine the promise of the Holy Ghost in John 14 and the work of the Holy Ghost in John 16? The crucial point is that we, as a rule, daily surrender ourselves to God, including everything we are and have, and that we also daily ask and receive by faith the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Why is it necessary to surrender ourselves to Jesus daily? Jesus said in Luke 9.23, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus said that discipleship is a daily matter. To deny oneself means giving Jesus the control over my life. Carrying a cross doesn't mean that we will have difficulties every day. Here it means to deny our egos and to submit gladly and willingly to Jesus. Just as Paul said about himself, I die daily. When someone carried a cross in Jesus' day, then he had been sentenced to death and was going to the place of execution. So it also has to do with accepting difficulties, which arise from following Jesus. We received our physical life at birth. In order to maintain our life, strength, and health, we normally eat every day. We received our spiritual life when we were born again. In order to keep our spiritual life strong and healthy, it is also necessary to take care of the inner person daily. If this doesn't take place in our physical life as well as our spiritual life, then we will become weak, sick, or even die. We can neither eat meals ahead as reserve meals, nor can we stockpile the Holy Ghost. In the book, The Acts of the Apostles, page 284, there's valuable advice on this. As in the natural, so in the spiritual world. The natural life is preserved moment by moment by divine power. Yet it is not sustained by a direct miracle, but through the use of blessings placed within our reach. So the spiritual life is sustained by the use of those means that providence has supplied. Unquote. This comment in the book Desire of Ages, page 313, really impressed me. We are to follow Christ day by day. God does not bestow help for tomorrow. Unquote. Ellen White said in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1113, to follow Jesus requires wholehearted conversion at the start and a repetition of this conversion every day, unquote. From the Review and Herald article, January 6, 1885, we read, However complete may have been our consecration at conversion, it will avail as nothing unless it be renewed daily, unquote. Then from Steps to Christ, page 70, Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, Take me, O Lord, is holy thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. Use me today in thy service. Abide with me, and let all my work be wrought in thee. This is a daily matter. Each morning, consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to him to be carried out or given up, as his providence shall indicate. Thus, day by day, you may be giving your life into the hands of God, and thus your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ." Unquote. Morris Vinden said in his book, 95 Theses on Righteousness by Faith, page 96, If you haven't discovered the necessity of daily conversion, it can be a major breakthrough in your life. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 101, makes this promise. If you will seek the Lord and be converted every day, all your murmurings will be stilled, all your difficulties will be removed, 
All the perplexing problems that now confront you will be solved. Unquote. Remaining with Jesus through a daily renewal of our surrender is just as important as it was when we first came to him. Morris Venden states further in his same book on page 233, the abiding daily relationship with God leads to abiding surrender, moment by moment dependence on him. Unquote. We may be certain that when we consciously surrender ourselves to Jesus every morning, then we are doing what he wishes us to do, because he said, Come to me, Matthew eleven twenty eight, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out, John six thirty seven. From Sons and Daughters of God, page 279, we read, The Lord is willing to do great things for us. We shall not gain the victory through numbers, but through the full surrender of the soul to Jesus, we are to go forward in his strength, trusting in the mighty God of Israel. Unquote. The great influence that God can exert through us when we completely surrender ourselves to him is described by John Wesley as follows. God can do more with one man who has committed himself 100% to God than he can do with a whole army of men who have only committed themselves 99% to God. From the Desire of Ages, page 523, we read, Only those who will become co-workers with Christ, only those who will say, Lord, all I have, and all I am is thine, will be acknowledged as sons and daughters of God, unquote. And from Desire of Ages, page 827, we read, All who consecrate soul, body, and spirit to God will be constantly receiving a new endowment of physical and mental power. The Holy Spirit puts forth its highest energies to work in heart and mind. The grace of God enlarges and multiplies their faculties, and every perfection of the divine nature comes to their assistance in the work of saving souls and in their human weakness, they are unable to do the deeds of omnipotence." Unquote. There is so much on this topic of daily consecration or commitment or surrendering your life or conversion. Why should a person daily ask for a new baptism of the Holy Spirit? Jesus lives in us through the Holy Spirit. Why must we ask him daily? In the book Acts of the Apostles on page 56, it says, to the consecrated worker, there is wonderful consolation in the knowledge that even Christ during his life on earth sought his Father daily for fresh supplies of needed grace. His own example is an assurance that earnest, persevering supplication to God in faith, faith that leads to entire dependence on God and unreserved consecration to his work, will avail to bring men the Holy Spirit's aid in the battle against sin." Unquote. If this was a daily necessity for Jesus, and how much more important it is for us. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, there's an important statement. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Our inward man needs daily care. In what way does this daily renewal take place? According to Ephesians 3.16.17 and verse 19, it happens through the Holy Ghost, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. As a rule, it is necessary to pray daily for a renewal of the Holy Spirit. As a result, Christ lives in us. He gives us power according to the riches of his glory for our inner man. The power of God is a supernatural power. Thus, God's love is put into our hearts, and it is the way to a life with all the fullness of God. See John 10.10 10 and Colossians 2.10. Another important text is found in Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with the Spirit. Take note that this is more than just advice. It is a divine command. Our God expects us to want to live with the Holy Ghost. The Greek experts say that this text says more precisely, and I'm quoting Johann Mager, let yourselves be consistently and continually filled anew with the Holy Ghost. Unquote. Our July 17, 2014 Sabbath School Lesson Study Guide says, Baptism with the Holy Spirit means to be completely under the influence of the Holy Ghost, to be completely filled by Him. This isn't a one-time experience, but rather something that has to be continually repeated, as Paul illustrates in Ephesians 5.18 with the tense of the Greek verb, filled. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Ephesians chapter 5, even though he wrote the following in chapter 1, verse 13, In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. 
the Ephesians had evidently already received the Holy Ghost. Nevertheless, it was necessary for them to be strengthened with might through His Spirit and to be filled with the Spirit. And let yourselves be consistently and continually filled with the Holy Ghost anew. In chapter 430, He warns us not to grieve or to insult the Holy Ghost. In the book Acts of the Apostles, page 50, we read, For the daily baptism of the Spirit every worker should offer his petition to God. And from Selected Messages, book 1, page 374, In order that we may have the righteousness of Christ, we need daily to be transformed by the influence of the Spirit, to be a partaker of the divine nature. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to elevate the taste, to sanctify the heart, to ennoble the whole man." Unquote. From Signs of the Times, March 8, 1910, we read, Those who have been impressed by the Holy Scriptures as the voice of God and desire to follow its teachings are to be daily learning, daily receiving spiritual fervor and power which have been provided for every true believer in the gift of the Holy Spirit, unquote. In the book Desire of Ages, page 313, she states, We are to follow Christ day by day, God does not bestow help for tomorrow, unquote. And from the Review and Herald, March 2, 1897, a connection with the divine agency every moment is essential to our progress. We may have had a measure of the Spirit of God, but by prayer and faith we are continually to seek more of the Spirit, unquote. I also found this amazing quote from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 8, page 191. You need a daily baptism of the love that in the days of the apostles made them all of one accord, unquote. Romans 5.5 5 shows us that God's love is poured into our hearts by the Holy Ghost. We find the same thing in Ephesians 3.17. The daily baptism with the Holy Ghost, being filled with the Holy Ghost, causes at the same time a daily baptism with love, being filled with God's agape love. In addition, it says in Galatians 5.16, that as a result, the power of sin is broken. The importance of a personal worship. What importance does personal worship have? If it is so important that I daily surrender to Jesus and ask to be filled with the Holy Ghost, daily worship and the observance of the Sabbath are the foundation for a spiritual life. We have already read Bible verses and diverse quotes. They show us that the inner person is renewed day by day. This casts a clear light on the great importance of our daily personal worship. The whole foundation for the worship service in the tabernacle was the morning and evening burnt offerings. On Sabbath, there was an additional Sabbath burnt offering. See Numbers 28, verses 4 and 10. What importance did the burnt offering have? According to the German theologian Fritz Reniker, the burnt offering represented the complete surrender of the sinner to the Lord. Here the person kept nothing for themselves, but rather everything belonged to God. Unquote. From the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 353, we read, The hours appointed for the morning and evening sacrifice were regarded as sacred, and they came to be observed as the set time for worship throughout the Jewish nation. In this custom, Christians have an example for morning and evening prayer. While God condemns a mere round of ceremonies without the spirit of worship, He looks with great pleasure upon those who love Him, vowing morning and evening to seek pardon for sins committed and to present their requests for needed blessings. Did you notice that daily worship is connected with the Sabbath as a basis for our spiritual lives? In addition, does it make it clear that it has to do with a daily surrender to Jesus Christ, who is invited through the Holy Ghost to live in us? Have you made the most important spiritual principle your own? To give God priority over everything, every day? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew 6, 33. The kingdom of God is when you have Christ in your heart now. This is why we need daily surrender and to daily ask for the Holy Spirit during our worship time. The decisive moment will be when we stand before God. Did we have the saving personal relationship with Christ? And did we stay with him? See John 15, 1-17. Don't you long for more? for greater fulfillment in your faith? Whoever spends little or no quiet time with God, or only has an inadequate worship time, will probably only be strengthened by their worship once or twice a week. 
That is similar to someone only eating once a week. To make a comparison, wouldn't it be absurd to only want to nourish yourself once a week? Doesn't this mean that a Christian without worship is carnal? This also means that if he stays in this condition, then he isn't saved. When we are carnal Christians, worship can be just an obligation. When we are spiritual, then worship will become more and more a necessity. Years ago, I read a booklet by Jim Voss. I was a gangster. He was a criminal who became converted. He wholeheartedly confessed his sins, for example, perjury, theft, etc. He experienced tremendous divine intervention. This impressed me. I said to myself, I'm doing fine in almost every way, but I don't have experiences like that. Then I prayed to the Lord, Father in heaven, I also want to confess all my known sins and all the sins that you will yet show me. In addition, I will get up an hour earlier to pray and read the Bible. Then I want to see if you will also intervene in my life. Praise God. He intervened in my life. Since then, especially, my morning worship in connection with the Sabbath has become the basis for my life with God. Through daily surrender and through being daily filled with the Holy Ghost, our lives will be beneficially changed. This happens during our personal worship time. Worship in spirit and in truth. Let's think about the objective of worship. In God's last message to humanity, it has to do with worshiping the Creator in contrast to worshiping the beast. See Revelation 14, 6 through 12. The outward sign of worship is the Sabbath, worshiping the Creator. The inner attitude of worship is shown in John 4, verses 23 and 24. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. To worship in spirit certainly means to worship consciously, but also to be filled with the Holy Ghost. To worship in truth means living in complete surrender to Jesus, who is the truth in person. Jesus said, I am the truth. John 14, 6. And it means, through the indwelling of Jesus, to live according to God's word and directives, because he said, Your word is truth. John 17, 17. And Psalm 119, verse 142 says, Your law is truth. If we don't have real worship now, then aren't we in danger of failing at a critical moment? This will be a big problem for all the carnal Christians. I think we all want to make progress with God's help and to grow in knowledge. It may be that the following false belief was a hindrance for some in moving forwards. Baptism and the Holy Ghost Some people think they are filled with the Holy Ghost because they are baptized, and thus everything is okay and they don't need to do anything more. D.L. Moody commented on this. Many think that because they were filled once, that they are filled forever. Oh, my friend, we are porous vessels. It is necessary for us to constantly remain under the fountain in order to be full, unquote. Joseph H. Wagoner said, In all cases where baptism is seen as proof for the gift of the Holy Spirit, the repentant sinner is lulled into carnal security. He solely trusts on his baptism as a sign of God's grace. Baptism, and not the Spirit in his heart, will be his sign or testimony. Baptism is definitely a significant decision. This corresponds to God's will. It has and will keep its great significance, but we shouldn't look back to an event in the past as proof that we are filled with the Holy Ghost. Instead, we should know now and experience now that we are filled with the Holy Ghost. Some people received the Holy Ghost before they were baptized. For example, Cornelius and his household, or Saul. Others received the Holy Ghost after they were baptized. For example, the Samaritans or the twelve men in Ephesus. But it is all the same if a person received the Holy Ghost before, at, or after baptism. What matters is that we receive the Holy Ghost at some time and that we have Him in our hearts now. It isn't crucial what happened in the past, but rather how things are now, today. I want to remind you again, we received our physical lives at birth. Our life is maintained by daily food, drink, exercise, sleep, etc. Otherwise, we wouldn't live very long. The same laws apply to our spiritual lives as to our physical lives. We receive new life through the Holy Ghost, namely when we completely surrendered ourselves to Christ. Our spiritual life is maintained through the Holy Ghost, prayer, 
the Word of God, etc. From the book Acts of the Apostles, page 284, we read, The natural life is preserved moment by moment by divine power, yet it is not sustained by a direct miracle, but through the use of blessings placed within our reach. So the spiritual life is sustained by the use of those means that providence has supplied. Unquote. Neither the physical nor the spiritual life remains automatically in us. It is necessary to use the means that God has provided for us. This means, when we are born again, the Holy Ghost is given to us to stay. But in order for Him to stay, it depends upon the daily use of the means which the Lord has provided us with. What result can we expect if we don't use the means? The Holy Ghost is the most important of all these means. In addition, Prayer is very important, being connected to God through His Word, taking part in the worship services and other things. I think we can agree that as a rule it is also necessary to daily care for the inner person. If we don't do it, then we will experience regrettable consequences. We can neither eat ahead nor can we stock up on the Holy Ghost. Desire of Ages, page 313, declares, God does not bestow help for tomorrow, unquote. I think it is reasonably clear that daily surrender to Jesus is necessary and that we should daily invite the Holy Ghost into our lives. Both of these matters serve the same purpose. They are two sides of the same coin, having an intimate relationship with Christ. I give myself to Him through surrender and by asking for the Holy Ghost. I am inviting Him into my heart. Among other Bible verses, 1 John 3, verse 24 See also John 14, verse 17 and 23. They show us that Jesus lives in us through the Holy Ghost. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. The Effects of the Holy Spirit When the Holy Ghost is in me, then he accomplishes in me what Christ achieved. Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death, we can explain the law of the Spirit as the manner in which the Holy Ghost works in a heart completely surrendered to God. Only the Holy Spirit can bring to life in me what Christ achieved. Desire of Ages, page 671, says, The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent, and without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. The power of God awaits their demand and reception." Unquote. Author Thomas A. Davis describes this process as follows. This means that even the effectiveness of Christ's work for people is dependent on the Holy Ghost. Without Him, everything Jesus did on this earth, in Gethsemane, on the cross, the resurrection and His priestly ministry in heaven would be unsuccessful. The outcome of Christ's work wouldn't be much more useful than that of some big world religion or ethical leader. But although Christ was much more than these, he couldn't save humanity alone through his example and teachings. To change people, it was necessary to work in them. This work is done by the Holy Ghost, who was sent to do this in people's hearts, which Jesus had made possible." Unquote. Isn't this alone reason enough to see to it that you're filled with the Holy Ghost? From Desire of Ages, page 173, we read, When the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. Sinful thoughts are put away. Evil deeds are renounced. Love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of sadness, and the countenance reflects the light of heaven. Unquote. There are many other valuable results from a life with the Holy Ghost. But there are also great deficiencies and losses without Him. The difference between a life with and without the Holy Spirit will be dealt with in more detail in chapter 4. Am I filled with the Holy Spirit? Please ask yourself the following questions about being filled with the Holy Ghost. Are there any noticeable effects of the Holy Ghost in my life? For example, has He made Jesus real and great to you? John 15:16. Am I starting to hear and understand the inner voice of the Holy Ghost? Can He lead me in the big and little decisions in my life? Romans 8.14 Has a new kind of love for my fellow man arisen in me? 
Does the Holy Ghost give me tender compassion and profound concern for people who I wouldn't normally choose as my friends? Galatians 5.22, James 2.8 and 9. Do I experience again and again how the Holy Ghost helps me to deal with my fellow men? Does He give me the right words to reach a person's heart who has worries and cares? Does the Holy Ghost give me strength to share about Jesus and lead others to Him? Do I experience how He helps me in my prayer life and helps me to express the deepest feelings of my heart to God? When we think about these questions, we see what a great need we have to grow in the Holy Ghost, to get to know Him better, and to love Him more. One brother wrote, My father and I have become reconciled. After studying Steps to Personal Revival in the 40 Days books 1 and 2, I had the wonderful experience of being filled with the Holy Ghost. It was especially exciting for me to experience how the Holy Ghost works and wants to work in every area of my life. Reconciliation between Father and Son My relationship with my father was always somewhat complicated. My wishes and prayers during my childhood and youth were always that I would have a better relationship with my father. But it got progressively worse. Another six to seven years went by. God filled the emptiness in my heart. While studying and praying for the Holy Ghost, my wife and I had a lot of big experiences with God. We prayed for our family and especially for my father. During this time, I received new power to love my father. I was able to forgive him for everything that hadn't gone well in our relationship since my childhood. My father and I are now friends. He also started to become more spiritual. And I also started telling other people about God. Now, two years later, the relationship to my father is still very good. I thank God for this experience. I used to feel so powerless and often alone. But since I've started to pray daily for the Holy Spirit, I'm experiencing a new and wonderful type of life and relationship with God. A prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you want to remain in me through the Holy Ghost. Thank you that through daily surrender, our trust and love relationship is growing. Lord, help me to get to know the Holy Spirit and his work better. I long to know what he wants to do for me, my family, and my church, and how we can have the assurance that we can receive the Holy Ghost when we daily ask. Thank you for this. Amen. Supplement for Ephesians 5, 18. Be filled with the Spirit. We can already see in the English text in Ephesians 5, 18, that this appeal is made in the imperative. Further, we can see that this command is directed to everyone, and we can also see that it is our duty to seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit, but the original Greek text makes it even clearer. Johann Mager comments on this. In the New Testament letters, there is only one passage which speaks directly about being filled with the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 5.18, Be filled with the Spirit. In the book of Acts, we find being imbued with the Holy Spirit is a gift, which is used to act in a powerful way in specific situations. However, Paul states being filled with the Holy Ghost as a commandment, which is independent from situations in life and applies to all Jesus' followers. This short but important command is comprised of four crucial aspects. 1. The verb fill, plerian, is used in the imperative form. Paul does not make a recommendation here or give a friendly piece of advice. He doesn't make a suggestion that a person can accept or reject. He commands as an empowered apostle. A command always appeals to a person's will. If a Christian is filled with the Holy Ghost, then it depends to a large degree on himself. Christians are subject to the command to strive to be filled with the Holy Ghost. This is our responsibility as a people to be filled with the Holy Ghost. 2. The verb is used in the plural form. The command isn't directed at a single person in the church who has special duties. Being filled with the Holy Ghost isn't a privilege for a few favored people. The call applies to everyone who belongs to the church always and everywhere. There are no exceptions. For Paul, it was normal that all Christians should be filled with the Holy Ghost. 3. The verb is in the passive tense. It doesn't say, fill yourselves with the Spirit, but rather, be filled with the Spirit. No person can fill themselves with the Holy Ghost. This is exclusively the work of the Holy Ghost. Herein lies his sovereignty but the individual should create the conditions so that the Holy Ghost can fill him. Without his active will,
the Holy Ghost won't work in him. 4. In Greek, the imperative is in the present tense. The imperative present tense describes an event that is constantly repeated in contrast to the imperative aorist tense, which describes a one-time action. According to this, being filled with the Holy Ghost isn't a one-time experience, but rather a recurrent and progressive process. A Christian isn't like a vessel that is filled once for all time, but rather has to be constantly refilled. The sentence could be expressed this way, let yourselves be consistently and repeatedly filled anew with the Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Ghost, which was given to us at baptism, can be lost when the fullness that was given us isn't retained. If it is lost, it can be gotten again. Being filled with the Spirit must be repeated so that the Holy Ghost can occupy all areas of our life and our spiritual life doesn't wilt feebly. Being filled with the Spirit doesn't mean that we quantitatively have more of Him, but rather that the Spirit has more and more of us. That's why Paul commanded all the believers to be constantly filled with the Spirit. This is a normal condition for a Christian, one baptism, but many fillings. Footnote. Johann Mager was a pastor evangelist for many years, a university lecturer on systematic theology. Most recently, he was the head of the ministry department in the Euro-African Division in Bern, Switzerland.